I like that line that says, Fasten to the rock which cannot move. I have been fastened to that rock which cannot move. Yes, I am fastened to the rock which cannot move. Rounded firm in the same. We have an anchor that keeps our soul steadfast and sure. Really doesn't matter what's happening around us. We have an anchor. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. But God is good. We come to the end of one year and we are about to start another year and um, quite often, uh, the Lord just lays something on my heart as far as a theme for us for the upcoming year. And, and uh, I uh, got a really good suggestion. I, I won't tell you this was the Lord. I got a really good suggestion, which as time goes on, you will probably come to agree with me. Uh, there are are things that we really need to know and understand and practice in our walk with God. And of late, we've been talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and uh, even this morning in our class, we were talking about the evidence. How do you know for sure that someone has received the gift of the Holy Spirit? And one of our old forebears uh, at the start of the Pentecostal movement, William Seymour, he said, you know, there's one way you can know for sure that someone has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The evidence is love. And, and uh, that, that is a very good thing for us to do. I, I will uh, embar uh, embellish this point a little bit as we go forward. But uh, next year, 2019, I'd like it to be our year of love, on trial love on trial you know what that means we're going to try ourselves every day to see if we really have love for one another there is a scripture that you can read in john chapter 14 um, right after jesus right after jesus had uh, served communion and his his um, betrayer had gone off to do his, his evil deed. Jesus started speaking to his disciples and he said, there's one way that people are going to know that you are my disciples. Do you want to know what that is? If you have love one for another. That was the one thing that Jesus said that would identify us as his disciples. And, and we want to really practice that. Someone else came to him one time and said, what's the greatest commandment of all? And for those of you who are uh, good Old Testament scholars, you'll know that there are 613 laws that the Jews had that they followed. And, and this lawyer was asking Jesus, what's the greatest of them all? And you know what Jesus said? He said, well, there are two things you need to know. The first is this love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength that's the first and the second is like it and that second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself and if we he said now on these hang all the law and the prophets everything hangs on this love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength and love your neighbor and so the question was, well, who's my neighbor? And uh, the, the questioner was sort of expecting it would be someone real close, someone that was like them, someone that they could really love. But uh, Jesus gave them a, a parable, told a story about a Samaritan. And he couldn't have done any worse than that, than to bring up a lousy, dirty, stinking Samaritan. 
as far as how the Jews looked at them. The worst you could be was to be a Samaritan. That was an insult. And here was a Samaritan in Jesus' story showing love to a Jew who was in need. Amazing. And so we are going to love on trial. And I'm not trying you, I'm trying me. I need to make sure that everything I say and everything I do, every action, every thought is loving. We will have a challenge on our hands. We will have a challenge on our hands. I believe that the Lord wants to fulfill the promises he has made to this church as far as an ingathering of souls to his kingdom. But I believe his hands are tied until and unless we truly learn how to love everyone who comes through these doors. And the reason that they will want to stay if they come in is because of what they will see in us. If they see that we love each other, they will want to be a part of us. If they see that we don't love each other, they won't want to have anything to do with us. And certainly if they don't see us exhibit love to them, that's death. And so this is critical for God to be able to do what he desires to do in us, with us, and through us. Our year of love on trial. <laughs> Please stand with me. We're going to turn to the word of the Lord. I'm going to be reading from John uh, Luke chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 22 to 32. I'll start there, but uh, the, the whole passage, we'll pick up on it as we go through uh, from verse 22 to verse 52, but as we stand, we're going to read from verse 22 to 32. This is the week after, and now Jesus is out of the manger. Uh, we, we read, that, that's, that's our theme for today, out of the manger. And we, we want to see uh, what happened once Jesus got out of the manger. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, of course we're speaking of Mary, they brought him, that is Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. It's the word of the Lord to us today. As many of you have realized, certainly if you're parents, there's something about babies. Babies grow really fast. All they seem to do is eat and sleep and grow. Well, they, they do other things too, but we won't talk about that. Uh, that's, that's what babies do. <clears throat> and so last week we celebrated the newborn baby Jesus in a manger. It was inauspicious, but still glorious. 
It was a start to his life on earth. And at this time of the year, we love to sing, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. But he didn't really stay in the manger for very long. Jesus didn't just come to earth to be a cute baby in a manger. Like all normal children, he quickly began to develop and grow beyond the infancy that we celebrated on Christmas Day. So as we read in our text, Jesus' parents took him to the temple on day eight of his life to present him to the Lord uh, for his circumcision and for his official naming. And of course, we know that they called his name Jesus. And, and so as he was there, Simon took the opportunity. He held this baby in his arms and he laid out Jesus' destiny to his parents a little more detail than Gabriel had, had done previously with Mary. It was just a, another glimpse into the future of this child who would soon be out of that manger. So verse 33 says, Joseph, oh actually, let me take you back to verse 29 where, where Simeon started to speak. He said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Holding this baby in his arms, he said, my eyes have seen salvation. Your salvation is here in my arms, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Jesus, the light of the world and the glory of your people Israel. And so we drop down to verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Amazing words that Simeon was speaking. He was waiting to see and hold this child before he died. And now this was the last thing between him and death. And it certainly seemed that he was happy to go. Your servant can now depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. And, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. And so Mary started to keep all of this in her heart, starting to hear and see and understand more of what this child was all about who she held in her arms. And even before they left, the temple, there was another witness, the voice of another witness being added. Verse 36 says, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him being Jesus to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So again, this redemptive work of Jesus, she started to spread around Jerusalem. This one, this one who Simeon held in his arms, this one eight days old who Mary and Joseph had brought to the temple was the one who was going to bring redemption to Israel. Then approximately two years later, two, three years later, wise men came from the east, possibly kings, possibly astrologers, certainly very rich men, coming to see this king who had been born. Uh, the reigning king Herod was angry when he heard that there had been a king born under his nose, so to speak, in Bethlehem. And, and so he said, no, go, go find this king and come and tell me where he is so that I can come and worship him also. Uh, the angel appeared to the Magi and said, look, don't go back to Herod. Go home a different way. And when, when he realized that they weren't coming back to bring him the news, introducing him to the baby king, he ordered that all the boys two years old and under were to be killed, trying to stamp out any possible threat 
to his throne. And so uh, the angel of the Lord went to Joseph and said, Joseph, get up immediately, which he did and left Jerusalem the same night uh, to, to take Jesus out of there and, and keep him safe from Herod. So I don't know at what age Jesus started to have memory, but probably one of his earliest memories would have been fleeing for his life as a refugee into Egypt. Uh, he, this, this was the first big experience that he had in his life. And finally, after Herod died, Jesus' family was able to return to their home in Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And no doubt his parents told him of all the incredible events that happened in his life, how he came to be here on earth, all the things that had happened, angels coming, uh, the flight into, into uh, Egypt and all of that. And as they sat by the fire at, at night, Jesus was growing, he was learning, he was you know, coming to grips with, with the reality of who he was. And then our next report of him comes at the age of 12, as he was uh, approaching the age of accountability to become a bar mitzvah. Uh, that, that term means a son of commandment. So as far as the Jews were concerned, when you were 13 years old, you are now able to be accountable for your actions, and so you became a bar mitzvah, a son of commandment. Now you needed to to uh, fulfill the commandments of the Lord, now you would be held responsible for your actions. And so at 12, just before this time, his parents took him as their custom was, and they took him to Jerusalem significantly for the feast of Passover. The first time Jesus uh, came uh, to this feast, it was a Passover feast, and of course we know what happened the Passover years later. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The Jesus we're starting to see is more than a cute baby in a nativity scene. Here he is growing into his teen years working hard with his dad, becoming a good carpenter, getting ready for his God-given mission. And certainly if we look at our world today, it's obvious that we really need this Jesus who is now out of the manger. We have so many messes we're dealing with in our world, politically, environmentally, societally, relationally, morally, educationally, economically, medically, even religiously. We have all kinds of messes that we're dealing with. So we truly need the one who said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is a, 
solution to all of the problems that we have in our world. This Jesus who is now out of the manger coming to fulfill his mission. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The one who spoke these words was no longer a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This is a Jesus who healed a paralyzed man and told him to take up his bed and walk. This is a Jesus who stopped a funeral procession, told a dead man to get up and return home with his mother. This is a Jesus who cast out a legion of devils out of a man in Gadara, put him back in his right mind. This is the Jesus who dried up a woman's 12-year-long hemorrhage of blood and then continued on the same day to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. And not bad for a single day's work. This is the Jesus who woke up from sleep with enough power to say, peace, be still, and have the Galilee obey his command. See, he's out of the manger now. He's doing what only he can do, making bad things good, changing and transforming lives. And I'm sure there's a witness today that Jesus is in the business transforming our lives. This is Jesus who saved an adulterous woman from death by stoning and forgave her sins. This is the Jesus who saved tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew and gave them a whole new life. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He's out of the manger. He's at work in his world. This is the Jesus that a leper called out to and, and said, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus said, I will be thou clean. That's the Jesus we're talking about. This is the same Jesus that Bartimaeus called out to say, I want my sight. And Jesus restored his sight even on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. So what is it you need from Jesus today? He's out of the manger. In fact, he's walking up and down these aisles. He is listening for your voice. He wants to hear your cry. What is it that you want to say to this Jesus? He is the one I'm telling you about today. He's, he's here. I, I, I hope faith will start to rise in your heart. His ear is open to your cry. His heart is full of compassion for you, he delights in blessing the children he loves. He fed multitudes of people. He healed those in need, even if it was on the Sabbath day when he was breaking the law in a technical sense. He is the one who taught the Sermon on the Mount that we spent our summer going through and rebuking religious hypocrites who wanted to lead people astray into who knows what. This is the Jesus we are talking about. This is the Jesus who empowered his disciples to go from town to town, preaching the gospel, uh, healing the sick, casting out demons, doing all the things that he himself was going to do. The same Jesus who says, I'm going to give you power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to have these signs that follow you as believers. You're going to speak in new tongues. You're going to cast out devils. You're going to heal the sick. You're going to see all this happening in your life and in your heart. This is the Jesus who's out of the manger and here at work in our life today. He wants to do a great work in you. He wants to do a great work in you. He wants to do a great work in me. I, I'm thankful that as we have had our Christmas celebration, of course we're still in, in what we call the holiday season, it is important for us, even as we come into this week, where we're going to be really taking time, setting time aside to seek the Lord, that we know who he is, why he came, and what he wants to do in you and in me. I am praying that God is going to help me. I, I don't mean to be selfish. You need to pray this prayer for yourself. But I'm praying that this Jesus, who, 
who didn't stay a baby. That Jesus in the manger wasn't preaching uh, words like, uh, here, is, here is how you will be known as my disciples if you have love one for another. That Jesus in, in the manger wasn't even able to speak a language that could be understood. Uh, he, he grew up. He grew up. And he has come for a work. He came for a mission. And I'd like him to accomplish his mission in my heart and in your heart. What do you need from Jesus today? He's out of the manger. All power is in his hands. And he's able to do for you whatever it is you desire. Child of God, what is your desire for how you can do a work for God? I'd like us to stand together and we're going to pray and take some time now to just seek the Lord. What is it that is in your heart, in your life, that you are anxiously, anxiously seeking the Lord for? I'd like you to bring that to the altar in prayer today. Jesus is here right now, the chorus says. Reach out and touch him. Jesus is here right now. Only believe. Jesus is standing near, ready your heart to cheer. He said he came to heal the brokenhearted. He's here to bring cheer to your heart. Jesus is here right now. Only receive. Why don't we just sing that softly as we as we start to come to pray. Jesus is here right now. Reach out and touch him. Jesus is here right now. Only of God. You have, you have heard of Jesus. You have celebrated Christmas. You have sung the carols and, and enjoyed receiving gifts and all of that. But there is, there is something that Jesus wants to give you today. As Sister Melva told us on Christmas Day, it's not our birthday, so uh, really it's not for us to receive gifts. But the truth is, Jesus came to give us a very big gift, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He has that gift for you. And again, it is impossible for us to get something like this because we deserve it, because we have earned it, because God owes it to us. This gift 
can only be received by faith because we believe in what Jesus has done, showing us his love, his grace, and his mercy. Mercy. He wants to give us that gift of eternal life. And we receive that as we lift our faith to him and say, Lord, if you're giving it to me, I believe your word and I want to receive life from you. We have this wonderful opportunity to call out to him in prayer, to say, Lord, I know I haven't been living the way I should have lived, but I want to change that right now. I'm asking you to forgive me of every sin I've committed, everything I've done wrong that's against you, your word, your will, your purpose. I ask you for your forgiveness. I'm asking you to come and live in me. Give me that life. And when you do that, when you make that commitment that you're going to live for Jesus, allow him to live in and through you, we come and we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the payment, the remission, the forgiveness of our sins. And he promises that he will fill us with his spirit. He will come and live in us and give us the power to live the life he wants us to live. And so I'm inviting you today to allow Jesus to give you the gift he wants to give you here at Christmas time. He wants to give you the gift of life eternal life and so we want to pray with you we want to help you answer any questions you have lead you to the foot of the cross where Jesus gave himself an offering for our sins and if you would like us to pray with you this morning wherever you are if you just raise a hand so I can see it we'll we'll have someone come and pray with you and, and they will help you if you're already here at the, the front, you raise your hand also, and, and we will certainly have someone, there are folks looking around who will be happy to pray with you this morning. Amen. Wherever you are, just raise your hand. Yes, I want to receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus has come to give me. And so if you're here and that's your desire, you raise your hand. Those who are close by will come quickly to pray with you. Uh, please uh, be attentive up in the balcony. We need some uh, folks to be praying there. Amen. Wherever you are, just raise your hand and we will have someone come and pray with you right away. Some of you might be at the altar here. Just take a look there. Uh, we have a need for uh, someone to go and pray with the lady up in the balcony. Amen. Jesus is here right now reach out and touch time to talk to God. So this is time now. We'll just ask Brother Chris to play softly as we pray. It's time for us to reach out to God. We began our service with prayer. We're going to end our service with prayer. Jesus is out of the manger. He's here today. He has gifts he wants to give to you. He has ministry he wants to birth in you. He has work that he wants you to do. There is, there is a life that he wants you to live that will give honor to him. There are things you have in your heart you want to say to him right now, things of the spirit you want to desire of him. Let's take this time right now and pray those prayers. 
Thank you, Jesus.